the stock market soars as the Fed signals the wait is far from over for higher rates. In today's cover story, banks, travel agents, and Cuban cigar companies light up with embargoes about to ease, and why traders are having a big Mac attack. Plus, more drama unfolds at Sony. First business starts now. You're watching First Business. Financial news, analysis, and today's investment ideas. Good morning, everybody. I'm Angela Miles. It's Thursday, December 18th. In our first look, stocks in a frenzy over the Fed. The bulls unleashed on Wall Street yesterday with the Dow up nearly 300 points. The Nasdaq up 96 and the S&P back above 2,000. As Fed Chair Janet Yellen Congress. says, it will be considerable uh, time the before the Fed raises rates. Marathon is the latest oil company to lose its mojo. The oil giant warns capital spending will be 20% lower next year as crude prices get crunched. And Oracle offers an upbeat report on earnings. Shares bounce more than 2% after the bell. In our first look at the trading market, trader Dan Stesich of Athena Advisors joins us now. Dan, stocks were fired up on the Fed yesterday. You know, not only the Fed, they went in strong. There's been a lot of fear on the market as to what oil is doing it. The FOMC came out with their announcement. They're transitioning away from considerable time, and they're going to be focusing on employment. Employment. So that's the thing I think you have to watch going forward, along with inflation. The market took it really well, and uh, we'll see how it goes today. What do you think? Is it time to get into some of these beaten down names like Halliburton? You know, I think you have to start looking at them. This oil price really put a lot of pressure on a lot of them. And Halliburton's a solid company. It's at 52-week low right now. I think it's like near a three-year low. And it doesn't seem to me that it's justified. It has a decent dividend. It's been a solid stock. It's been better levels when oil was lower than this. So I think that's one to take a serious look at. Quick check on this. Does the volatility continue in the market? You know, the volatility is going to come off a little bit. As long as we don't see any surprises out of the Middle East, out of Russia, or out of Europe, it'll subside some, but it'll be somewhat elevated going into the end of the year. Thank you, Daniel. You're very welcome. Let's bring in Chuck Coppola, who has more on why investors need to practice patience with the Fed. Angie, the Fed is keeping traders on their toes. Yesterday, Fed Chair Janet Yellen told reporters the Fed will be patient with deciding when it'll raise interest rates. The Fed is sticking with the language that it'll raise rates in considerable time. Yellen also says the Fed's getting ready to make a move, just not as soon as expected. Many traders believe that the rate hike is coming in mid-2015. The Fed's focused on inflation, though, as consumer prices from the grocery store to the gas pump fall to their lowest level in six years. Fed Chair Yellen called plummeting oil prices a positive for the economy. The situation in Russia has become so dire, the Ministry of Finance is reported to be selling the country's crown jewels to stop the annihilation of the ruble. Russian residents are scrambling to put their money into something, anything, other than a Russian bank. Many are sending their assets to the U.S. to be invested here. The dollar hit an all-time high against the ruble this week. According to a report by Capital Economics, $120 billion worth of private assets will move from Russia to the U.S. by the end of the year. Even Apple has halted sales of its products in Russia, citing extreme fluctuations of the ruble. In our cover story, the move to reestablish diplomatic relations with Cuba could be a boon to businesses. Among the projected winners, several industries from tourism, internet service providers, and banks. As Cuba and the U.S. discuss how to thaw America's 50-year policy of isolation toward Cuba, Travel and tourism to the island outpost of the former Soviet sphere of influence may be just the first signs of warming relations. These 50 years have shown that isolation has not worked. It's time for a new approach. Over the short, short term, say two years to 36 months out, you're going to see some ecotourism, some different types of environmental climatic uh, partnerships, but more science-based. Now, North American tourists often travel to Cuba through Canada. It's not known how soon direct flights may come, but it could be soon. And with an expected boost in tourism comes credit cards in the financial sector, eager to help Cuba modernize its banking system. In a lot of ways, Cuba is still uh, 60, 70 years back. Their, their in banking infrastructure, their commerce infrastructure. The third industry that may benefit is in a way connected to the American, Alan Gross, who was released from Cuba Wednesday after being held for four years 
accused of spying. Gross, who was there to help Jewish groups in Cuba, was accused of having Internet equipment, illegal in Cuba. Now, the Internet and e-commerce may be among the billions of dollars in business that helps Cuba leapfrog technologically into the 21st century. Cuba has potential for us to make some really profitable partnerships. And I think you have cheaper labor, so you potentially, in this movement to reshore American manufacturing, you have a nice compromise potentially in Cuba. If this is just about opening an investment window for the American banking industry or for large manufacturers to just find another place to run away to, then we, we just have another form of racing to the bottom. And with plenty of mountain views of the ocean, real estate interests are enjoying the notion that Cuba may also become a haven for expats retiring just 90 miles from Key West. In the U.S., there's a big pop in an IPO stock on Deck Capital, an online site offering lending to small businesses priced in at $20. Shares jumped more than 39% in its debut Wednesday. The opposite happened for the IPO of Rice Midstream Partners. That stock fell below its opening price of $16.50. Shares closed at $16.30. Rice Midstream is connected to the natural gas industry. Sprint is facing a record fine. Federal Communications Commission is getting ready to find Sprint $105 million for so-called cramming. FCC officials confirmed between August and October of 2013, Sprint received 35,000 complaints from consumers about unwanted charges, such as text message alerts, horoscopes, and sports scores. T-Mobile and AT&T have paid similar fines. Investors didn't get hung up on the news, though. Sprint stock was up 4% yesterday. Panera's Younger Diners have the restaurant chain taking a serious look at animal cruelty. Beginning in January, the chain says its pork suppliers will no longer keep pregnant sows in constricting crates. It will also work to get 100% of its beef from grass-fed herds. Right now, less than 20% of its hens are cage-free. That will also be improved. Consulting firm Technomic reports animal welfare has become a hot-button issue with millennials, and companies are responding. Panera stock rallied two dollars yesterday. Ahead of its earnings release Friday, BlackBerry is launching a new smartphone. BlackBerry fanatics will be pleased to know the device named Classic comes with a physical keyboard. It's the latest gadget the smartphone company is counting on to attract new users and previous BlackBerry lovers. Classic will sell for $449, which is $200 less than Apple's iPhone 6. BlackBerry shares rallied 4% Wednesday even as analysts are lowering their earnings estimates for the company. On to our earnings watch. Mining equipment maker Joy Global warns 2015 will be another challenging year. The company is taking a hit on low prices for coal and iron ore. Still, earnings and sales topped Wall Street estimates. The stock gained nine cents, closing above $46. At General Mills, the company posted a drop in sales on cereal and baking products, while yogurt performed very well. The food company is standing by its forecast for the year. That stock rallied 2 percent. And FedEx delivered disappointing earnings that fell below estimates, but it's also sticking with its guidance. FedEx shares spiked $6. Retailers are giving procrastinators more chances at last-minute shopping this year. Toys R Us is staying open from 6 a.m. on the 23rd to 9 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Amazon is offering a quick turnaround on gifts. If orders are in by 10 a.m. on Christmas Eve, customers in 12 metro areas can have same-day delivery. Rebecca George of RetailMeNot.com warns shoppers to exercise caution, though, before choosing last-minute delivery. We know that last year, 2 million of those last-minute holiday shoppers did not get their holiday gifts in time. So pay attention to the shipping dates. Tomorrow happens to be free ship date. And if you don't want to pay those expedited fees and you need to get a gift in time, you have to really consider the shipping dates. George adds popular last-minute gifts that require no shipping are e-gift cards, which may be purchased, sent, and redeemed online. Investors are in a rush to bite on McDonald's. Shares of the burger chain are up more than 3% during the past two days. Rumor has it activist investor Bill Ackman is taking a stake in the Golden Arches. CNBC reports Ackman may even be pushing the fast food giant to spin off some locations into a tax-efficient real estate investment trust. Some traders are using call options as a way to make a play on McDonald's stock. On the economic calendar for today, it's initial and 
continuing unemployment claims, the Philly Fed, leading indicators, and natural gas inventories. On the earnings calendar, Scholastic, Nike, Rite Aid, Red Hat, Accenture, Conagra Foods, Winnebago, and Pier One. Still to come, Sony brings down the curtain on its new film, The Interview, as hackers threaten to attack America. Plus, why Google and Apple want to peek at your driving record. And after the break, brace for impact, why the airline industry could land a multi-billion dollar bonus. The fall in oil prices is benefiting drivers, but possibly flyers, too. The global airline industry will likely see a windfall of around $12 billion thanks to lower jet fuel prices. Those prices are the biggest expense for the industry and has been a big reason behind extra fees. Cost benefits to the industry are not likely to translate to consumers anytime soon, though. Flights have been filled to near capacity, and until that changes, the industry probably won't be pressured to drop fares. Drivers across America are in for a happy new year. The Energy Information Institute reports the average driver will spend more than $1,900 on gasoline next year, saving on average $45 per month. The report also predicts gas prices will hover around $2.60 per gallon in 2015, down from $3.37 this year. Bill Mahler takes the driver's seat now for more surprises down the road. Google and Apple, they are two of the world's chief disruptors. Music, movies, the encyclopedia, you name it, the old way of doing things. So many of them have gone away or been dramatically transformed by these two companies. The next industry ripe for disruption, well, it just might be auto insurance. How is that going to work? Well, it'll involve your smartphone and data gathering. Becky Eric is a business reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And you write that our phones could become, you call it the central nervous system of driver monitoring behavior. You've written about telematics before. This is what you're talking about here. Hi, Bill. Yes, a lot of the insurance companies have these programs that monitor your driving, like your mileage and your braking. And in return, you might be able to get a discount. Now, typically, the way that they get this information is with these separate devices that plug into your car. But the drawback is, while those are very accurate, those are kind of expensive for insurance companies to have those kinds of programs that rely on the separate devices. So these insurance companies would love to develop smartphone apps. Everyone has a smartphone, or a lot of people have smartphones. So you could just download this app, and this app would monitor your driving. Now, the one drawback is those aren't quite as accurate yet, so the insurers are working on this program. But if and when these programs ever do take hold with the smartphones, one big question is, what does this mean for Google and Apple potentially becoming players in the car insurance industry? Yeah, they're already players in, in driving and, and in car ownership. They've done a lot of things. Heck, uh, they're, aren't they both working on driverless cars? They're both working on connected cars with ma some major automakers. And then Google itself has the driverless car. So regardless of where the car insurance companies are with their programs, these, these companies are already moving into these areas. Why is this important to consumers? This is important. Well, first, let me just say that they call these telematics or usage-based insurance the, the driving being monitored. And really, only about 10% of consumers currently are even participating in these growing. types. It is growing. It's like basically doubling. It doubled from the prior year. So it's going to be it's going to be growing. So people are going to save money if they participate, but also who's going to control this data? Are car insurance companies that we know today, are they going to be marginalized in these programs? Who's going to be controlling yeah, this information? Yeah, and might Google and Apple actually uh, charge for this information, too? Exactly. And yeah, you would think the consumer would be the rightful owner, and I'm sure Congress. Yes, Congress is looking at who's going to own this information. Becky Eric from the Chicago Tribune, thanks. Thank you. Coming up, a trader who's putting his trust in Twitter and a new twist in the hacking scandal at Sony, the creative way the film studio might get its controversial film to audiences.
Theaters across the nation are yanking the new film, The Interview. The movie was supposed to be released on Christmas, but cyber terrorists are threatening a 9-11 style attack if it runs. Joining us now, our movie man, with some thoughts on that mm -hmm. situation. What do you think about Sony's response? Well, I think this is a situation that's gotten really troubling in a great big hurry, and I think there's a lot of shaming that needs to be going around right up to where we are right now. So far, what we have is Sony pulling the premiere in New York of mm -hmm. the interview. Right answer, wrong answer? Uh, I think it's the wrong answer. I think at any point that you, we've been giving in to these cyber terrorists all through this entire process, I mean, you look at the media, could have had a chance to possibly plug this leak a little bit. Instead, they, you know, sort of gave in to sort of a gossip mongering culture that we have and released all these emails and all these things. They've basically done exactly what these people have wanted. There's some talk on TMZ that Sony will find a silver lining in this and maybe release it at a later date or play it pay-per-view. I like the idea of them actually sort of, you know, in a way, <laughs> giving in a way by releasing this thing on VOD, video on demand, and giving people the option not to go to the theaters, but to stay at home and actually watch the movie. I think that would be the best thing that they could possibly do. I don't agree with the idea of pulling the movie from theaters. I hope other theaters don't follow Carmike theaters, uh, what they've done, and pull the theaters, uh, pull the film from theaters. I think this is, the movie should stay there because it's a part of you know, cinema, and we need to have it there. Well, it was a big year at the box office. We have a list of the highest grossing films of the year, mm -hmm. and yes, we have a billion dollar baby there. <laughs> Transformers, Age of Extinction, coming in at $1 billion, Guardians of the Galaxy, Maleficent, X Men Days of Future Past, and Captain America. Look at that. A lot of wins by Disney. A lot of wins by Disney, and you'll probably end up seeing uh, the last Hobbit movie actually crack that list sometime in the early part of 2015. But it was a good year for Disney. Obviously. Obviously, right there at the top. Good year for those and Disney investors. Yes. The stock trading around ninety dollars, up thirty percent for the year. Right. Unbelievable. Let's mm -hmm. take a look at some of the box office bombs here because <laughs> the list starts with Transcendence, Legends of Oz, Sin City, Winter's Tale, and Pompeii. Yeah, one Sony film on the list. Not a very good year for Sony, unfortunately. Uh, but you know, those bombs. You know, we've had bigger bombs throughout the year, so it wasn't as bad a year. But uh, the certainly studios that did lose money. Last weekend at the box office, there was also a film that did not perform up to snuff. Exodus. Yeah, I mean, we sort of suggested that that film was not going to play as well. The reviews have been actually quite horrible on it, and uh, although the film did about double the money overseas that it did in the U.S., uh, we're going to see if it's going to actually find a way to make a profit for Fox. Along with the top five joining Exodus, The Hunger Games, Penguins, Top Five, and Big Hero 6. Now, coming up this weekend, it's exciting, The Hobbit, Night at the Museum, and Annie. <laughs> well, Annie, again, another uh, fortunate so Sony story, one of the films that was uh, leaked online at the early part of this whole terrorism operation. Uh, Night at the Museum, uh, the, the films have, the last two have sort of dropped in scale uh, box office wise. I think you're going to see the same with that because kids are going to be going to see the end of the Hobbit movie, this bloated nine, ten hour epic that Peter Jackson has concocted out of a 300 page children's novel. And But people will go see it, they'll finish it off just out of because they want to finish it, and then they'll forget about it pretty soon afterwards. Eric, thank you for coming on the show as always. Thank you. Still to come, is it time to hit the sidelines with Nike shares or get into the game? Chart Talk is next. Plenty to get to this morning with Matt Cavanaugh, CMZ Trading. Let's start with McDonald's. We reported on this stock earlier in the show. Traders are buying call options and investors are on a buying binge on word that an activist investor, Bill Ackman, is involved. What would be your strategy? Well, I think that, you know, Bill Ackman may or may not be involved, but what you see here is people looking at McDonald's, seeing the brand, and seeing just how far it's underperformed the market this year, and thinking, hey, you know, maybe there is somebody out there looking, and maybe some people who are looking for some value are going to come in and buy some McDonald's, even though they've been under pressure. So, you know, I think this is a good company. They've got a lot of competition, a lot of headwinds, but if you're looking for a place to invest money in the marketplace, it's a great brand, and, and eventually they'll turn it around. Another stock that is definitely getting a lot of play by traders is Twitter. I think it's just a trading vehicle at this point. What do you think about the value of the stock? Well, Twitter's been cut in half. You know, they were a $45 billion company. Now they're at 22 or so. So they've been upgraded recently. 
there's a lot of positives there, but also some negatives. And I think if you like them, then, then maybe you take a flyer on this. You know, they've got a good product, a lot of users all around the world. How they monetize it, how they come out remains to be seen. But, you know, I think you'll see once again people looking for value and saying, hey, Twitter's 50% of where it was, so why not? You're a big fan of Nike. Nike reports today this has been a star stock this year. Matt, is a level too high to get in now? You know, we've been talking about this this company, this stock for years. I've always loved it. I still love the company, but I think the valuation's just a little bit too high, and it's tough to say that after they've beaten nine quarters in a row. But you know, 29 times earnings, I think they're a little high. The athletic sector's been hot, but I'm hoping for maybe a pullback here and a chance to add to Nike. Matt, time for us to bounce. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Well, that brings our show to a close for today. Coming up on Friday, it's Traders Unplugged. Find out if the guys will go for a lump of coal this Christmas. From all of us at First Business, have a really great Thursday.